South Dakota's educational effort to raise awareness about the importance of soil health continues. The USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and I Grow South Dakota State University Extension for delivering these seminars with the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> my talk today is about cover crops, kind of pros and cons, and uh, we'll take just kind of a brief overview, kind of a uh, big picture look at the benefits of cover crops, and then go into some of uh, the uh, trials we've done in the Southeast Farm. I think uh, we we'll can come forward. Uh, before we start, I kind of just was running across some pictures that I saw I put in the presentation just to uh, think about why we're no-tilling. Uh, this is a ditch that's filled up with sediment. Uh, would be just uh, uh, north and west of Sioux Falls. And had a big rain there in the middle of June. And uh, this is me with my graduate student who since uh, left the program to farm in Minnesota. So I'm happy for him, but difficult for me. But uh, this is a uh, sediment fan from that same rain, probably a foot and a half or two feet of sediment there. So there's this last year in our trials at the, at the Southeast Farm, we really didn't see a big difference in yield between uh, no-till and conventional till. But when you consider some of these factors and some of these costs, uh, it makes the no-till look a lot better. So with that, we we'll move on to the cover crop part of it. Uh, uh, kind of taking a big picture look at it. When we think about the, uh, the natural system uh, in the spring, in the fall, and through the whole year, you've got living vegetation there. And all the time it's turning sunlight into organic matter. And that's doing two things for you. One thing, it's covering the soil, but it's, it's feeding the whole soil food web. When we go to an annual cropping system, all the way from April till our corn and corn soybean system, all the way up until sometime in the middle of June, we're not making full use of the sunlight that's coming down. On the other hand, we get into August, uh, late August, September, somewhere, in, somewhere early mid-September, our warm season crops shut down, and again, we're wasting a resource. There's sunlight that's being lost. So uh, we can't fully mimic a uh, 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 perennial system with annuals, and as Dwayne wisely said, we should have more perennials in our cropping system. But one step towards uh, addressing that is using cover crops, either before or after our grain crops, try and make use of that light to feed the soil. <coughs> and there's a lot of uh, potential benefits. Um, add organic matter, improve soil structure, reduce compaction, protect the soil from erosion. Uh, we have the potential to increase nutrient availability because we're pulling nutrients from deep in the profile and concentrating them at the surface. Uh, depending on what you do, it can help alleviate disease problems. There's some mustards. Uh, we did some work where I used to be in Maine with mustards for, uh, for suppressing uh, uh, soil pathogens some success. So there's potential for that versus forage for livestock. In terms of yield, about the broadest data I ran across is there's a SAR surveys over across the Midwest, about 1,900 respondents. 2013, we have about picked up on average of five bushel per acre yield benefit for corn and two for soybeans. 2012 was a drought year, it was twice that. So there is some potential for uh, yield benefits also on the short term. This graph's looking at soil microbial biomass. This is out of some work out of Ohio. <coughs> we have a quick literature review. Um, this is after corn raised for silage. And we've got two uh, cover crops, the old rye blend, the annual rye grass, and the control of no cover crop. And we're looking at microbial carbon. So this is uh, a measurement of microbial biomass in the soil taken the following year. And we see where we had cover crops, we had about three times as much microbial biomass in the soil the next spring. 
those microbes are helping us out, of course, they can be helping with suppressing diseases, they're also definitely helping out with uh, uh, improving soil structure. This is just by uh, uh, looking at nitrates in groundwater. Um, this is from further east again, but it kind of demonstrates the point. This is so groundwater uh, near the surface under a winter rye cover crop versus fallow. And the winter rye basically is acting as a living filter. So whether it's nitrogen or phosphorus or other nutrients, your cover crop is pulling them up out of the soil. That keeps them from being lost, but it also concentrates them at the surface. So even if you're in an environment where you're not worried about leaching, it's still a benefit, I think, to concentrate those nutrients uh, at the surface where the next crop can take them off. Okay, this is uh, some work looking at mycorrhizal infection rates, and this is uh, a study out of Australia. Uh, they looked at uh, 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 wheat as the first crop, and they came back with a number of different crops just to look at uh, I'm using both. They looked at a number of wheat, flax, uh, canola, mustard, as, uh, and a fallow. And the first year, the second year, they cropped the whole thing to wheat and looked at mycorrhizal infection. And basically, uh, where you have wheat and flax as uh, in previous crop, we had much higher mycorrhizal infection rates. The brassicas, which we usually don't think of as forming microbial associations, still were better than nothing. So basically what this is saying is we can, we can influence the mycorrhizal infection rate of, the, uh, of our crop by the cover crop we raised before. And then the mycorrhizae again help with nutrient capture. So those are all positive things. We're building soil microbial biomass. That's helping us out with uh, 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 soil aggregation, soil structure. It can help us out with suppressing diseases. Uh, we can concentrate nutrients at the surface. And we can try and build a network, build the mycorrhizal network to uh, opt to benefit the next crop. So cover crops can do all those things for us. Cons of cover crops, we have potential to use limited soil moisture. And that's a lot depends on uh, how the cover crops manage and when it's killed. You have potential to sequester nitrogen, which if you're going into soybeans or a legume crop, that's not a bad thing. You tie the nitrogen up. The weeds can't get it, the soybeans don't need it. But if you're going into a uh, corn crop, uh, then, then that, you, if you don't play your cards right, you may tie up some nitrogen that you could have used. Uh, there's a potential for it to act as a host or reservoir for disease problems. So, for example, uh, uh, hairy vetch is a, a host for a soybean cyst nematode. So if you have a soybean cyst nematode problem, and you use hairy vetch as a cover crop in your rotation, well, you just intensify the soybean cyst nematode uh, uh, potential for problem there anyway. In other words, the soybean cyst nematodes can grow and multiply on that hairy vetch, so they'll be there all the more the next time you cycle back to soybeans. So you have to think about, is your cover crop a host for a disease that's an issue for you? And then if the cover crop overwinters, you'll have to be able to kill it the next year. We've had a little bit of trouble with red clover with that, but just takes time. And the establishment cost, of course, anything is, is a cost associated with it. Okay, so with that, I will go to just some kind of uh, uh, share some information from work we've done at the Southeast Research Farm and uh, talk about some of our experiences there. This is some corn yield data from this last year. And we had uh, six different treatments. We have a low residue blend, a broadleaf blend. These two blends are primarily uh, brassicas and legumes, uh, radishes, turnips, uh, peas, cow peas, and uh, dwarf essex. I have a hairy vetch blend, which will, uh, uh, didn't do a, didn't overwinter very well this last year, so we didn't get much vetch out of it. Excuse me. Why don't you start to it? And then uh, control was basically no cover crop. The high residue blend was 75% grasses, so it was mostly millet, uh, sorghum sedan grass, oats. And then I had a red clover. And we can see the trend here, the control and the high residue blend, mostly grass cover crop did the same. So the grass didn't do a lot for us, even just numerically. Uh, 
the cool season broadleys, we picked up a trend for about a six to seven bushel per acre yield benefit. The red clover hurt us a bit, but that's because we didn't have good control with our, our initial burn down, and we, we picked it up later with some band mill. But that's an example of, you, of a cover crop that overwinters, and you have to be able to control it finally. Uh, so that's, that's my fault. Okay, for those cover crops, we looked at uh, uh, five different levels of nitrogen for each of them, and there wasn't any significant difference, so I'm just plotting this out for simplicity. This was the average response, and we picked up uh, peaked out at about 150 pounds per acre. I did just to show you, put in the controls are these red points, and the average of the broadleaf, cool season broadleaves are the green points. We kind of had this anomaly up here that uh, I think lost us our statistical significance. But you can see the trend there for the cool season problems to, to uh, do a little better. And kind of a trend uh, where we might be, they might have saved us a little bit of nitrogen at this point being up here. But we need to do this for a few more years to be confident of that. Okay, this is kind of a, a worst case scenario for southeast farm anyway, for drought. This is data from the 2012 season. Uh, we've got a number of different cover crops we looked at. Um, of course, 2012 was the driest year on record at the southeast farm. And if we include the data from Centerville, let records go back to 1898. So pretty severe drought stress. And you can see the average yield was only 26, 27 bushels per acre. So we really got hammered. But even under the severe drought stress, our cover crop plots did better than the no cover crop plots. I'll note all these winter fields. We didn't have any that came over into the spring. So even in our environment, uh, with a very nasty drought, which I hope we never live to see again, uh, we picked up 10 bushel per acre where we had a, a cool season cover crop plant. Yeah? Was that one, like, was the cover crop plant uh, this would have been after winter wheat. So this would have been winter wheat in 2011. Then these cover crops were seeded in August 2011. Um, and then the whole thing was seeded to corn the next year. So anyhow, the point is, if, if we've, uh, at least in our environment, our experience, and 2011 was not the uh, in 2011, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of moisture there either. Even under dry situation where we had cover crops that winter killed, we were, the benefits that we gained in terms of snow catch, the benefits that we gained in terms of uh, improved ability of those roots to exploit and explore uh, resources in the soil, uh, made up for any water that they had used. So we picked up the okay, so, uh, Take a little bit of a look at some work we've done with uh, uh, nutrient and then we did some mesh bag studies. I was interested in seeing how different materials broke down and released nutrients. Uh, um, this is some work a previous graduate student of mine, uh, Greg DeLink, worked on. Uh, and uh, uh, Jess Hall helped with this too. So we deliberately took a mesh bag that had kind of large pores, so little critters could crawl in and out of it. And we put about eight grams of either kale, alfalfa hay, grass hay, oat straw, or wood chips in them. And then we put those out in a uh, no-till field. Um, if we zoom in here a little bit, you can see there's the mesh bag at the bottom. So we set these out in the spring. And then we came back every two weeks and uh, took a look at the residue that was left and also took a look at how much nitrogen is in that residue. So this blue line is a kale. We can see that crash really fast. Uh, this yellow line is alfalfa, grass hay, oat straw, wood chips. So we can see that the material with relatively low fiber content broke down very fast and this kale really melted away. Uh, within about six, seven weeks, it was pretty much gone. You almost had to use your imagination to see it there. If we look at the nitrogen remaining, uh, then we can see the scale released the nitrogen right 
within uh, uh, four weeks with mostly all uh, released. And alfalfa a little slower, going on about six weeks. Um, the oats trough didn't release much, and wood chips just were, were there. They were relatively inert. So what we can do is take uh, uh, on this, this slope, express it as a negative logarithm, and as a measure, it's an indicator of how fast the material breaks down. So I did that, and I plotted that slope versus the NDF level. So this is neutral detergent fiber. So uh, on this axis, zero means it's basically not breaking down. It's static. The more negative it is, the faster it breaks down. So as you go down on this, on the y-axis, it's breaking down faster. So we got the kale broke down the fastest, then alfalfa, hay, grass hay, oat straw, wood shavings basically didn't break down almost zero decomposition. And we've got a linear function to NDF. Actually, it just fits better than uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. So basically, the reason I present this is I think this can be a tool that you might be able to use when you're thinking about managing residue. If you select for things that are high fiber content, they're going to tend to persist, break down slower, and last longer. If, you, if you're selecting for things with low fiber content, they'll tend to break down and melt quickly. So if you think of it, your radishes and your turnips don't have hardly any fiber. They melt and they're gone very fast. If you think of your uh, small grains, especially if they get in, if they start to uh, join and put on any stem growth, you've got a lot of fibers there and they're going to persist longer. So if you can think about your fi the fiber content of the mix that you're putting together, that, uh, at least that's how I try to put a handle on how, where the residue is going to stick around or go away. Okay, this is some data from uh, a little bit older data from 2011. This is in the spring. We've got a broadleaf cover crop blend and control, and we're looking at residue levels. We actually have less residue where we had the cover crop than, than the fallow ground. And, and I think Dwayne's observed this many times that when you have a cover crop, you're keeping the soil a little warmer in the fall, you're holding in moisture. Also, you're accumulating all those nutrients at the surface, and as that winter kills, it all melts down on that straw. So now you've got a little warmer environment, things are going to break down faster, and you're providing more nutrients for the microorganisms. So you actually end up with less residue, depending on what you choose in the spring, than uh, you would if you didn't use the cover crop. So again, this is a cover crop management tool. If you want, if you want to get rid of residue, you choose things that are low in fiber. If you want to, uh, if you want that residue there and you need it, then you better think about things that are high fiber content. Uh, I think we'll just skip this slide, but it's it's basically looking at nitrogen release. And again, it's showing uh, this axis of nitrogen release for the following crop. These are some. This is a literature review I did. We've got legume averages, radish, cereal size, cereal flow. Basically what this means is the legumes and the radishes are releasing nitrogen, they're breaking down. These low cereals are tying up nitrogen because they're adding more carbon to the system, more energy for the microorganisms, uh, but they're uh, not supplying as much nitrogen. So the microorganisms are competing with the next crop. Okay, so we'll switch gears here a little bit and look at some work we've done with winter rye after corn and with corn soybeans. So this is a corn soybean system, and basically we're, we're looking at putting in rye after the corn and killing it out ahead of the beans. So this is data from this last year, an uh, on-farm trial with uh, Al Aaron at Crooks and also at the Beersford Research Station. And we haven't seen, we don't see any significant difference with or without the rye cover crop. Uh, Al's been, we've been doing this at Al's place for I think four years now. And this is probably uh, um, the third cycle on this particular field. And we're starting to see a trend for it to be statistically significant. That 0.11 means we're about better than 80% sure this difference is real, even though it's just a push on it. So we would think maybe if we keep doing this, because we're always putting them in the same place, 
that the benefits will accrue and we'll see the we'll see the yield benefit down the road. But to this point, it's uh, we haven't seen it. This is another trial. We looked at broadcast seeding versus drilling. So the broadcast seeding went in uh, uh, around that stage or just before. And then the drill was after harvest. This is pictures taken the following spring. And we pretty much uh, have pretty decent stands as far as the cover crop goes with the broadcast seeding. You don't see it in the fall, but it comes in the spring. And this is again data from 2013. We looked at four different corn relative maturities, uh, 75, 85, 95, and 105. And each one we broadcast rye in, and then after the corn came off, we drilled in rye. And uh, in our environment anyway, we have the, the broadcasting has worked pretty well. Uh, this year we flew on some rye. Uh, finally found somebody that would do that in our neighborhood, so we'll see how that works. Uh, preliminarily, it looks all right. <coughs> so there's another side to this story, and that is uh, sometimes when you go through the drill, we lose some residue because of the wind blowing. So this is pictures from Al's place. Uh, this is taken in May, and you can see right here, over here is where the drill went, and over there didn't go. And we lost some trash here. And I went through and we did, uh, took uh, samples in our plots at Beersford at the research farm um, in uh, uh, Sarah Bird did that. And we, we didn't get a statistically significant difference, but numerically we lost about 30, the, the, for biomass, this is in June the following year, was about 30% lower where we went through with the drill versus where we didn't. So there's kind of a hidden cost. Uh, and again, that wasn't statistically significant, so maybe, maybe we'll do some more otherwise. But it looks like we're losing 25-30% of our residue just from the action of the drill going over and the wind picking up the uh, stubble and blowing it away. So that's a that's a that's a, a factor to consider, and that's another reason really we're interested in applying it out at this point. So we'll see how that works. I think it will work all right because even if we don't get a catch in the fall, we get enough snow and rain and freezing and thawing over the winter to come to the spring pretty aggressively. Okay, this is the soybean yield. Uh, following is different uh, uh, rye treatments, and we hate this crop. Um, and we didn't really see any difference in uh, soybean yields. And the, the broadcast and drill treatments would have been seeded the first week of July, and the control would have been in the third week of May. So in 2013, we didn't see an effect. However, in 2012, we had a big effect. Uh, we did the same thing at a rye biomass crop. We took it off for hay, and we only got five bushels per acre there because we went into that very severe drought and there wasn't enough moisture there for the soybeans to get established. Where we had no rye control, we picked up, we had a, you know, yield we weren't happy with, but it was much better than where we had the rye biomass. <coughs> so that's 20 bushel per acre. Okay, if we look at a couple other places, the uh, same year, but not quite as severe drought stress, this is data from Crooks. And Arlington, so Alan, you're either a cooperator at Crooks and Jess Hall in Arlington. And these guys weren't as greedy as we were. So we took that rye off for hay, which was a mistake. Of course, hindsight's 25. That's part of the experiment, so it's all right. But these guys uh, weren't as greedy about it. They sprayed the rye out, they sprayed their cover crops out in early May, and they didn't see any yield loss. So what that kind of, we can infer from that is if you're going into dry weather, the, when you kill the rye or your overwintering cover crop is, is going to be a big factor on whether it becomes a liability or not. And here we, the yields were essentially the same with the control of the winter rye. Uh, just had winter wheat rye, triticale and control, no uh, cover crop, and he tended to have a little better yield with the cover crop, but it wasn't statistically significant. 
Jazz really had a good year though, so that wasn't uh, uh, a drop the year there that broke as much as it was for the South. Okay, this is just kind of some data to illustrate that. Uh, this isn't from our study, but it kind of shows the effect. This is out from Minnesota. Uh, we're looking at soil water on this axis and bait along here, and the black line is the travel treatment, and the red lines are uh, 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 soil moisture under a winter rye cover crop. And the solid lines are the top foot of the soil and the dash under the second foot. But the main point, when they have two sites, Morris and St. Paul. But the main point is out here until we get to the you know, middle of May, there's not a lot of difference. We get out here, as we progress further into May, we get some separation. This rise using up moisture. And in our case, we were greedy. We let the rye grow, cut it for hay, hoped for rain, and didn't get it, and we got hammered. Uh, Al and Jess were more sensible. Uh, they sprayed it out early, and they didn't see any yield loss. So in think, terms of thinking about cons, if you've got a cover crop that's overwintering, and you want it to use moisture, that's great. If, if, if moisture is a concern, you better kill it early. <coughs> and this is some data from uh, Pennsylvania, and it kind of illustrates the same point. I'm gonna run out of time here pretty soon. Um, but basically, they were looking at hairy vetch uh, cover crop with different rates of nitrogen and corn. 2007, they had a good year. They looked at killing the vetch in middle of May versus late May, and it did as well as their, uh, their well fertilized uh, corn crop. Next year, they, uh, the later they let the vetch go, the worse the yield got. And the late May killed the corn follow, and the late May killed hip, uh, vetch cover crop, and yielded poorer than the unfertilized control with no cover crop. And then what happened here was they went into a spell of dry weather. So this is just another example of having a winter annual cover crop, letting it go long, and if you go into dry weather, uh, the outcome isn't good. Okay, we did a little bit of work also uh, looking at grazing. And this is, uh, we're grazing um, uh, uh, winter rye that's raised again between corn and soybean crop. <coughs> And we looked at fall and spring graze, uh, only spring graze and ungrazed, and we're looking at soybean yields here. Now, uh, the fall grazing was pretty much continuous grazing. The field just fenced off and the cows are growing. And they're out there, uh, they were out there for a few, four weeks. The spring graze, were, the plots were basically mob graze, so the cattle were only on a given plot for one day and then they moved to the next one. So we didn't let them stay out there very long in the spring. They were going from place to place every day. And basically, we didn't see any negative impact on uh, soybean yield. And the trend is for a little better yield where we had grazing. So uh, it looks like the grazing didn't hurt us, maybe help us in this situation. But again, the spring grazing was pretty tight to manage. I think with that, I'm about out of time. Got till two. Did you have till two, Pete? Oh, I got till two. Oh, I thought I could do no more five. I guess so. <laughs> I can tell some stories now. <laughs> well, for some reason, I had in my mind I'd need to be done at 145, so I guess I need to do that. Okay, so uh, let me see back here. Yeah. Okay, so we picked up, uh, well, we basically we, can say we didn't see any ill effect from grazing the cover. Again, this is, a, this is a system with corn. We seeded winter rye after corn. Uh, the cows really didn't, I mean, the winter rye was pretty small in the fall. So I don't think the cows got much winter rye to chew on in the fall. They were mostly eating corn stalks. Then in the spring, they were uh, uh, after the winter rye. So I think this could be a tool, again, as far as nutrient cycling, if we're trying to increase nutrient cycling, if we want to, because we're in a wetter environment, want to reduce residue levels, uh, that's, that grazing could be a tool. Okay, this is another trial. Uh, we're looking at uh, 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 grazing annual forage. So 
So in this particular trial, we replaced the grain crop with the old pea forage mixture, went through and strip raised that, came back and reseeded behind it the sorghum sudan grass cowpea mixture and grazed that uh, again and tried to get a second grazing. So basically went through it three times, but the third time there wasn't a lot of growth because we were a little bit short of moisture. Uh, and we only had two replications. So the data is, is, uh, has to be taken with a grain of salt. But basically, looking in the field, we didn't see any difference in uh, grazing versus ungrazed. We didn't uh, uh, see any significant effect of grazing on corn yield. So we can at least say the grazing's not hurting us. Uh, I think if we play our cards right, maybe we can get it to help us. Uh, but for sure, we can say if it's properly managed, it's not hurting us. And this was kind of a, a, a nice little plot because we had about five acres that we took out of production. But because we had that in the cycling, uh, uh, these were bred heifers through there, then we were able to graze them later on cover crops and corn stalks. So that five acres that we took out uh, actually penciled out pretty good because of all the value we got from the forage and the rest of the system. And this is kind of just a, a little bit of anecdotal information. Again, there's only two reps, um, but this is the, those corn plots. And looking down the road, and I put my hat there right where the fence was. And this is wild proso millet right in front. So you, where, where do you think the wild proso millet is? On the grazed or ungrazed side? It's on the ungrazed side. This side of it, we hate the oats off. And that side over there, I'm pointing at that like you can see it. <laughs> that side, this side over here got grazed. So this was mob grazed three times. This was ungrazed. And we came through in the spring, uh, we used dual uh, and uh, uh, sharpened pre emergence, and then we used glyphosate uh, uh, and bamboo post emergence. But this wild foxtail millet came in after the glyphosate plant. Uh, uh, but there's something going on here where our grazing is out helping us with controlling these uh, annual bees. And this is, I don't try to understand it, but day and night difference. You could just, you could walk out there and you could just right down the line, right where the fence was. And this is about 400, 450, uh, 500 pounds per acre of weed biomass here versus less than 50 back there. So some points to consider, and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm going to go ahead anyway. Uh, blends are better than single species. Uh, corn yields at, at Beersford in our experience, we tend to do well with uh, cool season broadleaf blends. So blends that are high in brassicas and lichens, corn tends to favor that. When we go with blends that are high in grasses, we don't see much, either we get a low benefit or no benefit. Okay, uh, resin breakdown is related to fiber and protein content, so that's a point you can manage. You can think about as you're selecting a cover crop blend, is this blend going to be high or low in fiber? And you can get an idea how well it's going to persist and what's going to affect your residue levels for the next year, whether you want it or not. You can manage that. Uh, with overwintering cover crops, uh, there's potential to lose yield if the cover crop's killed too late. So as in our case, we were interested in looking at rise of biomass crop. We decided to hay it off, see what we got. And in a wet year, that was fine. That didn't hurt us in 2013. 2012 killed us. So if it looks like you're going into dry weather and moisture is a concern, you want to get the cover crop knocked down early. Uh, you can also lose some yield due to competition or nutrient sequestration. We did plant some uh, soybeans into rye that was just about to head up. It's about this tall. And uh, we planted into a green. This is another trial. And uh, sprayed it out again with a little bit of Sencor, uh, sharpened and dual and glyphosate. You can tell we don't want to have any glyphosate with this weed. And, uh, uh, we knocked the rye down, but we, the soybeans didn't look quite as good. 
through the year, and, I, and we didn't see a statistical difference, but we were about, I think that we might have lost a couple of bushel per acre. Anyway, letting that ride go too late uh, uh, definitely is not going to help you. And it might tie up some things. Okay, and so far to this point, for, in our experience, we haven't seen any short-term yield response from rise of carbon crop ahead of uh, raising it between corn and soybean, corn and soybean system. Now, I think those benefits should accrue over time. And I think if we keep going, uh, we'll see the benefits down the road. So we hope. But to this point, having run it uh, on a short-term basis, two or three cycles, we're not seeing it yet. Okay, uh, next point is just an obvious one. Uh, choose cover crops that won't be a, a, a harbor or be a reservoir for pathogens for the next crop. And just to increase your diversity in your system, you want to try to select species that, that are not related to your grain crops, if at all possible. And for us, that's another reason I think the grasses for the cool season broadleaves are good, because we don't raise peas, we don't raise canola, we don't raise cool season broadly with grain crops in the southeast part of the state. So when we have a brassica, <coughs> pea, lentil mix, those crops are all uh, create a break in the cycle. Okay, use so species selection and time to control cover crops to minimize costs and avoid problems. So that's really the name of the game. If you want to think about the cons, is your species selection and then killing it in a timely manner. And we haven't seen any yield losses with well-managed grazing. And I guess I, my take on the cover crop deal is it's a long-term investment in soil quality. So uh, depending on the situation and the year, you know, sometimes we picked up 10 bushel an acre on corn, six or seven bushels. Um, we picked up a trend this last year at Al's place for to pick up maybe a couple bushels on the beans, but other times we haven't gotten anything. But uh, we, it's, it's a long-term investment in, in, uh, in your soil, and you're building capital for the future by growing cover crops. And depending on the weather, you may or may not see a big return in the immediate, you know, short term. So uh, with that, I think uh, that ends my talk. Yeah, you got the time for questions. Questions or comments? Uh, you know, if other people have other experiences, that we we all benefit from. Um, you talk about minimizing or avoiding uh, related species. Um, to what extent for following wheat or uh, no grass or what certain species of grass in the mix? Um, uh, we put some grasses in just to have some diversity, so we'll, we'll run like 20% uh, with oats. Altogether, oats, millet, sorghum, and then grass, and maybe 20% 20, 20 of the mix, and then 80% of it will be uh, dwarf Essex, radishes, turnips, peas, and lentils, throw in a few cow peas to have one season lady. So I don't exclude them all together. Uh, millet doesn't seem to hurt. There's a little bit that I've that we've worked with millet that corn doesn't seem to mind that so much. Uh, so I would say you probably want the majority of your blend, you know, uh, 75 percent or more of it to be something else. Um, now, if I want corn, right? Yeah. But, but on the other hand, if if you were in a situation where you want a residue there, then you might play that differently. Um, and you might want some more species in there that are high in fiber content. So in that case, you might want more uh, uh, oats, maybe barley, maybe uh, already mentioned millet, flax, things that are high in fiber content. If you, if you want that fiber the next year, we don't want the fiber the next year. We don't want the residue the other next year. Because we're, we're generally too wet to go. So, uh, but if you were in a 
drier environment, you might want that. The things that would be really closely related to corn would be like sorghum, sorghum, sedan grass, forage sorghum. So if you're going into corn, I would avoid those. But keep them really small part of it. Um, that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. On no. your uh, ride, which is feeded into corn stalks going to soybeans the next year, uh, is the seed bed in comparison with the control, with no ride? Was there a better seed bed, more tilting ground? How did, you know, how did it compare for seeding into uh, well, we didn't have money to do uh, like soil quality analysis, but when you looked at the at the field in the spring, yeah, the rock, where you had the rye, the soil looked better. It smelled better, had better texture. I mean, just the uh, aggregate stability was better. I'm just looking, you know, as a, as a visual assessment. So it looked better. You could just give a shovel in, and it seemed like it was uh, in better form, better shape. But we didn't see a yield. We the yield depth is, is negligible. We haven't seen yet. We haven't seen some people do that. But I think I just visited with some guys from Nebraska that have been doing this longer, and they said it took them five or six cycles. And now that we're pretty much always scheduled that. So I don't. That's that's what we've seen. Now the plots at Al's place are pretty big. What two thousand feet long? Yeah, a little bit longer. So one ninety by yeah. two thousand feet. So those are big plots. We're not talking a little plot. Uh, the plots at the research farm are small. Yeah? How late did you plant that winter? Uh, the winter rye goes in after the corn comes out, middle to late October. But uh, in our experience anyway, winter rye is really tough. And you plant it in October, and you can go out there in December, and you plant see only 1 or 2% emergence. Uh, first time I did that, I wondered what are we going to get, and we go out there in April, and there it is. So uh, it's tough, I guess. Uh, I think the main folk, if I remember right, just close your eyes and plan. Well, don't look at the calendar, plan. That was it. <laughs> when the car comes out, don't look at the calendar, plan. And that works. When yeah. You, uh, graze in the fall, and then it's the end of spring. Yeah. When it gets muddy, do you pull them off? Uh, well, we only did that one year, and we didn't have, we didn't, it didn't get money. It was on a no-till field, of course, um, and also the cattle were only in a given area one day. So it was, man, that, the spring basin was managed pretty tightly. Yeah, if it got money, we'd have pulled them off. And, and even if it wasn't money, we, they, they weren't in one spot for more than a day. You know, they're fenced off, they're there today, tomorrow they're there. So they don't really get a big chance to pack them. But, and we only did it once, so I don't want to say, you know, that's bulletproof, but we did, the one time we did it, we didn't see it, it didn't hurt us. More questions? Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, Do you have any economics on that, the, the spring grazing? Uh, we will. It's uh, got a, uh, a master's student working on that for his thesis. So I don't have that in hand, but he's supposed to generate all that. Okay, let's thank Dr. Sachs for coming today.